We begin at O'Hare Airport in Chicago, Illinois, where I went to meet Steve, my cameraman and comrade on this adventure. That's Steve right there. And that's me. We hightailed it out of the Windy City and headed on down to the grand old state of Indiana to investigate deep-fried breaded pork tenderloins, a delicious sandwich which is on the menu of almost every restaurant in the state. Hell, even Indiana Dairy Queens sell a pork loin fritter. If you're wondering what a tenderloin looks like, that's it right there. It's a monstrous portion of lean pork, covered in breading, deep fried, and served on a normal sized hamburger bun with your favorite sandwich condiments. If there was one sandwich that is a trademark in the state of Indiana, it's the breaded tenderloin. People traveling through Indiana owe it to themselves to try a good Indiana breaded tenderloin which you cannot find on the east coast, west coast, or in the state of Florida, or Texas. You don't find them in, in Iowa, you don't find them, I know some people from Iowa, hell they never heard of them. Now, that, I always wonder, you go to Florida you can't even get a tenderloin. I have many friends that want to come up here to visit. The, even some people used to work for me. Hell, they get a bunch of dry ice and want to take some of them home with them, you know. It's just too bad that, that people that, that don't live around here that have experienced a tenderloin and then move away where you cannot get them, they just, I have people call here and just crave for a breaded tenderloin. If it's a good tenderloin, you'll never forget it. You'll want another one and eventually you become addicted to them. The one lady that was here last week said, I asked my son what he wanted for his birthday, and he said, I want Mr. Dave frozen breaded tenderloins. <laughs> it's addictive because they're so good. Uh, it's a heck of a sandwich. There's just a swath through here where uh, tenderloins are part of life. <laughs> On our journey throughout the state learning about tenderloins, Steve and I ate 23 of those bad boys and not one too many. <laughs> like that, Jensen? <laughs> the first step is to buy a good piece of meat to make your tenderloins from. We do not buy frozen pork. We do not buy our pork pre-cut before it comes in. We cut our own, and that is the main factor in a good tenderloin. This is rather time consuming, but it's what separates us from other restaurants. So there's what you put through the cuber. And that makes a delicious tenderloin. Some people run it through a tenderizer, other people don't. Some of them flatten them with their fist. And it's dipped, breaded, and whatever breading the people enjoy using, deep fried, and served on a bun, lettuce, pickle, tomato, and mayonnaise. That's the way I like them. I kind of like mine deluxe. Uh, sometimes deluxe, sometimes just some, some pickle and ketchup. Just all kind of depends on the mood I'm in. Onion, not a thick piece, a thin slice of onion. Mustard on top and ketchup on the bottom with three pickles. Truthfully, I just like lettuce, made and mayonnaise. But anybody else, someday I like a little mustard, you know. If you eat a bunch of tenderloins like we did, you'll notice that while they all taste great, not all tenderloins are shaped the same way. Some make theirs thick and meaty, others serve them wide and flat. But one person who does not subscribe to the latter philosophy is Mr. Dave. A lot of people think that biggest is best. They want a lot for the money. We try to give people a thick piece of meat. We're not interested in making our tenderloins look like an elephant ear. A tenderloin the size of an elephant ear is going to have about 30% breading. And people do not want breading, they want pork. While Mr. Dave de-emphasizes breading, 
Other places use it to differentiate themselves from the pack. The, the breaded tenderloin done well is a breaded tenderloin, and there's not a whole lot of difference except for those things such as breading that people who do it right use to individualize their particular tenderloin. You know, some of them use a cracker crumbs, some of them use bread crumbs. I've eaten them simply floured, a uh, mixture of flour and cornmeal. It's kind of dealer's choice on the, on the breading. But if they're good, wherever they come from, the breading's superb because they've been doing it a long time and they know what they're doing. Some people focus on adding all sorts of herbs and spices to their breading. Others feel the key to tenderloin success lies in the grease. I haven't used nothing here in the last 15 to 20 years except some kind of cholesterol free shortening. It costs a little more money, but it fries everything so much nicer and gives everything so much of a better taste. You don't have a greasy a tenderloin coming in here with all bite into it and a bunch of grease comes out of it, you know. And it's saturated. It's not no lard or no vegetable oil and all that. It's, it's healthy junk food. We are proud that we serve healthy junk food. <laughs> and if you look at my parking lot, all you see is a bunch of senior citizens. You don't see a bunch of punk kids. The punk kids don't have no money. If they did, they wouldn't they'd be out working, wouldn't they? Okay, so Morris got a little off topic there at the end, but you get our point. While all tenderloins are delicious, each one is unique in its own way. There are a lot of ways to fix them, as you're finding out. And a breaded loin's a breaded loin. But these guys who do it and do it right, they put their mark on it somehow. And there are subtle differences in them. And each of them have a legion of people who contend that this particular restaurant has the best in the world. You can get a good argument going if, for example, you say, well, so-and-so's restaurant, they got the best loins in the world. And if someone present has been eating his loins at another restaurant for years, I mean, instantly, you've got an argument. But that's part of the fun of the, the breaded tenderloin. Yeah. Steve Jones isn't kidding. When word got out that we were coming back to Indiana to do a documentary on their beloved loin, newspaper articles started cropping up as Indiana locals and food critics debated which restaurant ought to be featured on our little show. Places like Mr. Dave's in North Manchester, the Acme Bar and Grill in Fort Wayne, the Marathon Gas Station in Knobbone, Indiana, those are the places we ate at and they treated us wonderfully, giving us free tenderloins and generally rolling out the red carpet for us. Get this. The Columbus Regional Hospital, in our honor, held Three Little Pigs Day. They set up a decorated tenderloin station whereby hospital patrons could build their own tenderloins at a condiment bar as assorted pig stuffed animals stared up at us and hospital staff members dressed in spirited pig garb. And it only goes to show how big a deal it was to these people that their tenderloin was finally being paid attention to. In fact, Upon hearing that a couple of outsiders were documenting their beloved sandwich, the Indianapolis Monthly asked me to write a cover story about why the tenderloin is so popular in Indiana. Here's what I wrote about. The first thing you gotta do is look at Indiana's Midwestern culture. In Indiana, fire and brimstone God-fearing is still alive and well. What few Starbucks you'll find are liable to have a bird's nest in the bee. And Indiana traffic jams are likely to be caused by John Deere tractors and Amish folks. Believe it or not, you'll find Amish horse and buggy parking where you least expect it. Indiana's principally a rural state. Like any state, we've got cities, but uh, I mean, hey, this is country. Indiana people are not flashy, they're down to earth with a farm background. Almost all of us have farm backgrounds somewhere down the line. And clearly, that rural farming culture, and specifically its hog farming culture, is reflected in its local cuisine. 
Well, a lot of foods are local. A lot of foods are regional. And the tenderloin falls into a local, regional food because the roots are of, of the farms. I mean, people have clung to those heritages around here, among them, bread and tenderloins. I mean, we're not talking French cuisine. Hell, we're talking Indiana barn cooking. That's where it all started. Yeah. Well, you have a lot of farmers out there, a lot of hog farmers, making, making a living. They supply us with pork, and we have a, our way of fixing and preparing their pork and selling it to the community and the people. And that's very important to them. These farmers nowadays that raise this pork are, are putting out a very, very good product. And these hogs are very lean. Isn't that a beautiful piece of meat? And there I think Mr. Dave hit it on the head. Tenderloins are popular in Indiana not just because pork culture is so pervasive, but because it is the filet mignon of the hog. A pork loin is an excellent cut of meat. So you're starting out with the best piece of the pig. It's clean tasting, it's tender, uh, it's, 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 it's excellent. Well, I just think it's a great sandwich. Everybody knows about my tenderloin. You can ask anybody, they love my tenderloin because my tenderloin has been a great tenderloin. On a weekend, we'll sell 12 to 1,500 of them a day. That's not a week, now that's a damn day. I think most people around here know about breaded loins and consider them uh, a delicacy and uh, are delighted to have the opportunity to go a short distance to enjoy them. Uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenon which has never ceased. Thank you.